<laughs> okay, so we're having a little fun. Remember I said this is soft start, right? So we're just having a little fun. So uh, let's laugh. Let's just laugh. Oh, yes. Oh. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit of an enactment, illustration of being in heaven. Okay, so all of these things are just, whether it's my graphics or this, the videos or whatever, it's to help us secure the reality of what theology says. To take theology and somehow extrapolate or extract reality out of it, sometimes it's tough. And so the more we can have applications, illustrations, dramatizations, whatever, it just helps us put more feet on the, in the, on, you know, on the, you get the point. Anyway, so what we're going to do, did you see, do you remember the dual realities of the believer? You remember that document? It's in your handout. It's in your blue folder. Remember the little three, three little thrones? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Kent. I need you over here. I'm so sorry. So we're going to let Kent, thank you, Kent. We're going to let Kent represent uh, Father God or, or the Ancient of Days, whichever you prefer. <laughs> oh, that was bad. Oh, Kent, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, for a young man like you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then, father needs a son, right? So, Bill, you just stepped right into being Jesus. How about that? Does he look like Jesus or what? Come on! Oh, well, whatever. So, I, if I was you, I'd just take it, okay? I'd just receive it. Just receive it, okay. We don't need a lot of drama right now, okay? Right? Just relax, boy. <laughs> I'll do the talking. Okay, good deal. So... <laughs> Stacy, I don't know. <laughs> so, okay, now we need, remember in the little three thrones, we need somebody called you and me. And so I think it would be good to have Stacy to represent you and me. So what do you say? Since Jesus is the bridegroom and we're the bride, it seems to work out pretty good here, right? <laughs> so, okay, so we have father, son, and me, and you, right? Okay, that's really cool. We have another drama queen here, okay? So she, she's ready to take over. <laughs> Good job. Okay, so um, we, uh, I'm trying to figure out which part of this I want to do because there's some setup to get into it. But um, So anyway, uh, when Jesus was raised, he was seated at the what? Right. Where's your right hand, Father? Good job. <laughs> Good job. No, your other right hand. No, you got it. It's the right hand. So are you on his right hand? Yep, he's on the right hand. And so then we were raised, Colossians 3, since you were raised, to where? Where did you get raised? Ephesians 2, 6, seated with Christ in heavenly places. Woo, this is cool. Like the picture's coming together. How about this? This is really cool. Now, uh, Remember, I've said several times over the last few days, on your very worst day, this is your reality. Let this burn in. Just really and truly, this is a holy moment, actually. Let this burn in to your thinking right now so you never forget it, on, even on your worst day. <laughs> even on your worst day, when everything's gone south and you were the one that did it. This is your reality. This is your beginning place from the moment you got saved through the rest of eternity. Well, unless God changes something later on, we'll give him permission to do that. But for now, this is your reality. This should become your default thinking. Never again. I realize we're still in the process of renewing our mind. So that's why we still do activations to ascend. Because we haven't got our mind renewed. The truth is our spirit man is seated here more really than you can believe right now. 
So what we're trying to do is just burn into our mind, our visual, our auditory, everything about us, burn it in that this is our reality so that we get our mind renewed. Once we get here and the tethers and moorings, the, the, the chip ball and chain to the earth positions, earth paradigms that have uh, grown their tentacles into every part of our uh, thinking, once those get cut off, then we get set free into not just here, from there to here, but now we get set free into the heavenly realities. Now, yes, some heavenly realities start before that. And thank God he's a wonderful father. He likes to uh, water the soil of our hearts and, and uh, add desire, create desire so that we'll stay on the path with him. Okay, so this is a really good deal, amazing deal. But can I tell you, it gets better than this. It's actually better than this. You, how could it be better than this? You know, by the way, how could you ever have a bad hair day if this is where you are? Think about it. No wonder Paul could say, um, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. No wonder uh, James, I think it is, says, count it all joy when you're under so many uh, trials and temptations. For the, uh, for the trials of our uh, for the trying of our faith works patience and when patience has its perfect work we'll be made mature and complete lacking in nothing why is that because God sees this and this is his beginning place this is where he starts with you and I once we've given our hearts to him he saw this to happen way back when we were enemies to him that's why Jesus could go through the cross because this joy right here inspired him this joy took him through the cross Right, Bill? Yeah. Okay. Good job. <laughs> now, like I said, it gets a little bit better than this. Maybe a whole lot better. Somebody quote Colossians 3, verse 3 for me. You guys are good. There you go. That's the essence of it. It says, for you have died, and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. So Kent, if you don't mind, scoot back in your chair a little bit, all the way. You're going to need to get firm. You got your feet together, Bill. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to get up, move this way, and sit down on Father's lap. I like my son. <laughs> you do. And then this is you and I. Stacy's you and I. And we're hidden with Christ. If you don't mind, sit on on your bridegroom's on your bridegroom's lap. And then, if you don't mind, watch your hands. But you go all the way around. There we go. You and I are hidden with Christ in God. Just let that burn in, guys. This is serious. I mean, I know we're having fun and games, and it's awesome. But this is more powerful than you can ever imagine. I hope you never forget this scene. This is what's happening with you right now. You see, if you and I saw ourselves like this, our hearts would be healed up in short order. We'd be empowered to our full identity in short order. Because perfect love casts out all fears. Okay, you got it? All right. Thank you, Father God. You did awesome. Bill, Stacy, good job. Good job. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. You guys got it? Is it burned in? Good job. I didn't hear any yes. I guess, I guess it is. So are you ever going to have a bad hair day again? I can't. It's not possible. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, really and truly, when things start going haywire, going south, what are you going to do? You see, Father, uh, what was that little picture thing that Mark did there? What was that? Where am I seated? And let me pull up uh, Ephesians 2.6. 
Oh, yeah. I'm seated with Christ. And every, oh, that's right. Colossians 3, 1. I was raised. That's past tense. Where did I get raised to? Oh, yeah, with Jesus. Mm. And I'm hidden, hidden with him inside of God. Just coach our minds into not just victory, but because victory is going to be the outcome. Coach your minds into reality and let it steep. Let it marinate there. Pretty soon you'll get to thinking those kinds of thoughts. Comments. Somebody tell me something. I don't know. Oh. I might be stepping out on on a bit. Sorry. <laughs> um, just with the the imagery here of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and us. Yeah, out the front here. Um, one of the things that the Lord really showed me about that uh, is that because we are seated in Christ Jesus and Christ is on the throne with God and the throne is not a chair, it's a seat of power, right? Um, that the first thing he showed me was that when I picture myself in the throne room that I'm not out in the crowd looking at the throne. I'm on the throne looking out at the crowd. And... Because the seat of power, um, so authority, we, we often, we've heard a lot over the decades about the authority of the believer, which is, and it's awesome, right? Um, but the throne, so uh, someone who's in authority, like a policeman, has the right to carry out the laws of the land or the laws of the government, yeah? Would, would that be how you see it? But the government is the position that makes the laws right um, and so what do you think the throne what do you think God's throne is is it a place of authority or a place of a government it's a place of government right so we are in a more elevated position than just those who have authority on the earth we are actually seated in Christ Jesus in the seat of power of the heavens of all the heavens and all the earth and so we are in the most extraordinary position. I've, I've got a passion for us to understand our true identity in Christ. And so we actually occupy a seat of government in the heavens. And we're being graced into growing in maturity to know how to operate in that. Good point. Good point. And I'd like to... Um uh, add to that, which is super good and accurate. accurate. Uh, I want to cite Esther, the book of Esther. And uh, here we have a young lady who is probably like you and I, that we don't really know our identity or our worth or our value. Uh, she was uh, orphaned, most likely, because her cousin was overseeing her life, Mordecai. And uh, she probably did not see her beauty, natural beauty, because that's what the king was looking for, is natural beauty. She probably did not evaluate, I should say, uh, uh, recognize or acknowledge that in her life. Mordecai seemed like he did. And so when the king needed a queen, Mordecai said, well, it sounds like you're the right guy, or right gal for the job. Now, first of all, Mordecai is probably representative of Holy Spirit. And he goes around searching the minds and hearts of men and the heart of God. And he always put things together. In fact, Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, which I think could be said something like this. Anytime the Holy Spirit speaks, he's going to make Jesus look bigger or better or us to be more attracted to Jesus. So he makes Jesus magnified. So anyway, uh, what Holy Spirit, Mordecai did was... Uh, Esther, I think the king's going to really like you. Let me talk to you a little bit. I know I've got to get your mind in gear so that you're kind of uh, in a frame of mind to go through the rigors to get there. And she finally said yes, and of course the king chose her. Now, that's all fine and dandy. Now we get up to the problem with Haman. And Haman's going to kill all the Jews, which of course included Esther. Now, what did Esther do? Her plan of attack was not to um, assert her official position. 
That wasn't her plan of attack. You and I, when we start out, uh, we do have amazing clout with God, an amazing position with God, but we have so much immaturity, we can't hardly whip our way out of a wet paper bag, as they used to say. <laughs> you get the point. We, just, we can't even, we can't have, hold ourselves in victory, ourselves for one day. Not to mention a family or a block or a company or a church or a city. And here we're, we're saying that we're governors, which we are. That's what God sees us. But we, what, we do, what I think we want to do also is acknowledge that the growth process is very real. It's very real. So how did Esther find her place of effectiveness? I was talking to somebody at lunch and... Uh, and they ask, so how do you start this? You start out with conversation, which leads to intimacy. And from there, you gain your clout. Now, we've got clout. The cool thing is God loved us before we loved him, before we knew anything. But that's wonderful. And so God did a ton of stuff for us before we even got started. But before we learn how to govern, we're probably, no, I shouldn't say probably, we are going to have to learn how to entertain his presence, entertain his heart. So let me see if we can just unpack a little bit what Esther did. Here's Esther. She's got a problem. She could have demanded, King, I demand my rights. I'm the queen of this whole kingdom, and I must have some rights here. You need to be mindful of the problem with me and my kin folks. And how would that have gone down? You're like, you you sound like you sound like my last queen. How'd that work out? Okay, guys, and this is with all seriousness and tenderness of heart of heart. Esther implored his heart, not his mind. She didn't demand legal rights. She said could I pro provide a banquet for you? I'll have all this stuff, just like Deb and uh, Andrea and whoever else has been working, Jocelyn. Just like you gals been doing, just putting the finest stuff out there and her presentation is wonderful. King, could I do that? And by the way, kind of an interesting, an, an, an interesting aside. She says, and by the way, bring my mortal em enemy too. Bring my arch enemy too. Now she didn't call him that, of course, because the king didn't know about that. But she did. Interesting that this is, we'll find this interesting, pastors. And I've done this so many years, is that we get to church early and we drive out all the bad guys. <laughs> we talked about this last night a little bit. <laughs> and Esther's ploy, her plan was to have the bad guy there. Well, what is the wisdom of that? Anyway, so she entertains the king. And the king's like, his heart is inflamed with love and passion. I like that. Your perfume, perfume's pretty good too. And by the way, do you want anything? I'll give you anything up to half of the kingdom. Oh, king, you know, if I found any favor in your eyes, could I give you another banquet? King's like, whoa. This is pretty good. Two nights in a row. Well, let's do it. Yes. And so the next night we have the banquet and all the exchange that goes on. And then finally when Esther is convinced of the favor of the king, which sadly, that's the way we are sometimes with the father. I don't know if he loves me enough to do this for me, whatever. But the point I want to make is she did not demand her rights she implored his heart. And so when the king's heart was ripe with passion, anything you want, it's yours. She said, well, by the way, that guy wants my head. What do you think the king's going to do at that point? Now, did she have governance, authority, and power the whole time? But how did she use it? Wisdom, wisdom 
told her how to use it. She implored his heart before she demanded her rights. And I believe with all my heart, like I was talking to several people today at lunch, that is God's desire for you and I. Implore his heart. Develop intimate relationship. And in that, he's going to say, could I do this for you? Could I do this for you? And by the way, what else would you like me to do? Oh, and you got an enemy? Off with his head. <laughs> so, yes, we have all kinds of authority, more than we absolutely ever realize. But then there's the issue of wisdom, of how we use our authority. <clears throat> Excuse me, especially with our Father. And uh, one of these days, we'll be co we are already co-everything legally, but our, I always call it this way, there's positional authority and there's uh, legal authority. I'm sorry, positional authority and relational authority. Sorry, I was having to fish through my file cabinets. Positional authority and our relational authority. We have position with God that says we're royal priests and holy kingdom and all the whatever, you know. And then the relational is, well, I haven't talked to you for a long time. Maybe I could get to know you first before I start wielding the sword. Do you know what I'm saying? So anyway, you guys will know. You're big, you're big grown-ups. You know how to do this stuff. So uh, Kent, if you don't mind, do we have just enough for rally us with some kind of something to get our hearts pulled together, and we'll see where we go from there. You're so faithful. You're running after me. You're so faithful. You're so faithful. You're so faithful. Running after me. Never let me go. Never ever let me go. You never let me go. You'll never ever let me go. You never let me go. It's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after It's running after me. Your goodness is running after It's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Good, good, good. He's running after us. It sounds a little like, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Do you have an angel named mercy and an angel named goodness? Chasing you all the day. Well, just slow down. Just slow down. Just let him catch you. <laughs> so years ago, a good friend of mine, Kansas City, we've been friends for 40 years and so maybe 20 some years ago, a good friend of his had a dream about him. He said, no, I had a dream. There were two, two angels with money bags in each hand. They were running after you, trying to catch up with you. And so the joke we always had was just slow down, Noel. Well, Noel uh, was just living hand to mouth like we all were back in those days. And he started a ministry in Africa, in Kenya, where he drills wells and builds uh, community buildings and uh, starts, you know, evangelism that way. And uh, the ministry is just going amazing. And he 
he uses no uh, uh, foreigners to come in. He just goes in twice a year. He raises up the nationals, and he just and they they do the stuff, you know. Nowadays, the guy has millions given to him because all of his money goes right there. It doesn't go to overhead and whatever. He said, you know what? I just slowed down, and the money bags angels caught up with me. <laughs> and nowadays, every time we get together, every time, almost without fail, he, begin, he ends his uh, prayer meeting with, and Lord, I bless him with finances, and may the money bags angels catch up with him. Would you like to have some money bags angels? Would it be okay if uh, such as I have give I thee? Okay, so Lord, uh, just hold your hands out or whatever your posture is for receive. Lord, I just bless your precious, wonderful people with provision beyond any of their expectations. And money bags, angels, we bless you now. You're under commission from the Heavenly Father, throne of God, to minister to all of us who inherit salvation and take care of us all according to all of our needs. You provided all of our, uh, uh, how's the Bible go? Uh, he's given us, Provide all our needs according to his riches and glory. And angel, since you like to fulfill the word of the Lord, you guys got it? You catching it? Okay, then angels, I bless you in Jesus' name to fulfill all needs. And then abundantly above all we could ask or imagine. And then with their cup running over, you see, I'm just quoting the word. I'm just quoting the word. And angels love to do the word of God. Okay, so angels, there you go. Go get them. I just painted targets on every one of them. Amen. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, let's see. So, uh, did any of you, have any of you sketched anything? Remember we started out the first night. I didn't mention it, maybe not yesterday, but uh, the one blank sheet of paper was for you to sketch what you're seeing. I know some of you have seen some things because you told me about it and we've talked about it openly. So have you sketched that? Now, why would you want to sketch some things that you're seeing? So that, remember the one, the thing about angels? Why did I make a thing about angels? It wasn't primarily for your sakes. It was for me to keep it in front of me so I don't forget, so I get familiar with it. Scripture at one point says, bind his word as frontlets over your eyes bind his word so we want to bind the rhema the revelation that he gives it gives to us bind it in front of us so that we don't let it just squander away like sand or water through our fingers and it's like uh i remember one time i had a goosebump you know i don't know what that was about but it did feel kind of good you see you can't extract any nutrition out of a memory that you can't remember so you bind it as frontlets in front of your eyes so that you can see it. So hopefully you've sketched a few things. If not, you'll do better next time. <laughs> okay, today we're going to talk through kind of two subjects. I'm going to start with, first of all, our heavenly paradigm, and then I'm going to end with heavenly rules for the road, and that's the front and back of the same document or same sheet of paper. A heavenly paradigm. You say, well, back to the initial and very legitimate question, is it okay for me to go spend time in heaven? Well, first of all, that is our inheritance. And by the way, I think all of us, probably without exception, believe that after your ticker stops, you believe you're going there, right? Uh, some of you are. <laughs> Two of you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, here's an interesting thought. Here's an interesting thought. If you get to talk to angels and tour through heaven and explore and experience and enjoy all of the wonders of heaven after you die, then that kind of makes death your savior, doesn't it? Are you okay with that? No. I'm not okay with that. Because, by the way, didn't we just quote a verse? Remember the three people up here? Father, Son, and you? And you said, we quoted the scripture, it says, For since you have died, 
Your life now is hidden with Christ and God. Question is, how many times do you have to die before you can go to heaven? Just a thought. Just ponder that for a while. How many times, <laughs> Bill, how many, how many times do you have to die before you get to go to heaven? Well, I would say since you died, remember the Bible says you were co-crucified with Christ. You were co-buried with Christ. You were co-raised with Christ, co-resurrected with Christ, co-seated with Christ. You're a co-heir with Christ. You're co-ruler with Christ. You're co-everything. I hope you like Coco. <laughs> but the first one we started out with is you died with him. Is that real? Now, I know it's theology, but is it real? Okay, so real and theology can be the same, right? Of course, should be. So since you have died, then why can't we experience heaven now? So am I, am I ruffling the feathers enough so that you can kind of dig in and get, some, get some, some footing on it? Okay. Well, then let's go to Hebrews 12. And we're going to read through just a few verses because this to me paints the picture. And if the interesting thing is the tense, the tense of this passage is past tense. It's not like someday you will. The tense is you already have. Okay. So Hebrews 12, verse 1, or I'm sorry, verse 22, but point number one says, For you have come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion, you already have. Remember we referred the other day to our blueprint verse in Isaiah 2, verse 2 and 3. It says, in the latter days, God will raise up the mountain of the house of the Lord above all the other hills, and the nations will stream to it. Verse 3, and many will say, come, let us come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, because there's where he's going to teach us his ways, and we're going to learn to walk in his paths. And that's where the word and the law of the Lord should go forth from. So here it says we've come to Mount Zion. He, Isaiah says someday that's going to happen, right? In the latter days it's going to happen. This verse 22 says it's already happened. Huh, somewhere between Isaiah 2 and Hebrews 12, it happened. When you got saved and were co crucified with Christ, you entered into the same death process that Jesus did 2,000 years ago, but it became real to you at the moment that you gave your heart to the Lord. At that moment, all the realities that Jesus afforded for you and attained for you through his death and obedience to Father God on the cross now became yours. And you were now positioned, found yourself located in Mount Zion. The fact that you may not believe it or were not told about it doesn't mean that it's not true. You just don't get to enjoy the benefits. Not that you don't get to, it's just that you aren't. You can as soon as you hear, as soon as you believe. This is a past tense event. You have come. Okay, so my response is, wow, Father, I'm here now. I don't have to wait till some latter days thing because you said it's already happened cool so what's here lord what should i look for well number two point number two is we've come to the city of the living god in the heavenly jerusalem whoa 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 all the realities of heaven are here the city of god the, the city that god lives in is here this is amazing Okay, God, you got my interest. I think uh, anticipation is driving me wild. Okay, something like that. Point three. The first thing it begins to describe as we get here, the first thing maybe is more numerable than anything else, is a company of innumerable angels, and they are really, really happy. First of all, there's too many to count. And they're really happy. And one of their missions is to minister to those who inherit salvation, which would be me and you. You too, Marisha. Yeah. Thank you, she says. <laughs> we, 
they, they're here to minister to us, and there's way more than we could ever count. That's what NIV says. So let's think here. You walk in, you're a stranger, first time here. Now, it'd be kind of nice when you walk in that they all come up and greet you. And I bet you the angels are. We just are not acknowledging them or haven't developed the sensory apparatus to be able to be aware of them. But what would it be like if you walked in this room and you kept your nose up in the air and you didn't talk to anybody? Now, you'd look a little snobbish. You'd look a little rude, right? Everybody's like, what's wrong with that person, you know? <laughs> You've just walked into a company of innumerable angels. I don't know if we can make a direct parallel or a mirror application on this, but I have a feeling Father is telling us about it so that we'll be invited into fellowship. I mean, what's it? What do you think Father would do this for? Tell you all the descriptives, like, but don't you even think about integrating with him? Nope. Off limits. I'm going to tell you all the fineries and all the wonders, but nope, 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 nope. Don't even think about engaging with him. I don't know. Just sounds like my Father's heart would have more permission granted. Okay, verse or number four. We've come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Huh, who's that? Who are we talking about there? Anybody want to venture a wild guess? Okay, nobody's risky enough. We're talking about you and me. Are you, was Jesus the uh, firstborn of many brethren? Okay, and uh, he was uh, established the church of the firstborn since he was the firstborn right church are you his church yeah and uh, all those whose names are registered in heaven are written in heaven is your name written in heaven yes. yes well you guys are getting good that's good you're getting over your fear that i might pull a surprise attack on you <laughs> so you guys are doing good yes your name's written in heaven now i want to tell you something that's going to going to rattle you a little bit and you're not going to stop thinking about this and I hope you don't because I believe with all my heart father's inviting us into a reality that we haven't even considered yet you see we do get together with convenings like this it's wonderful after covid it's more wonderful <laughs> and after california it's more wonderful <laughs> I live in Missouri. It really didn't affect us much at all. But anyway, <laughs> somehow we didn't have COVID over there. I don't know what the deal was, you know. COVID is very selective. <laughs> is it okay if we have fun like this? Okay. <laughs> but we, we like convening like this. This is really great. But we're only able to relate on what we can see and or hear. And maybe a few warm fuzzies that we have once in, a week, once in a while between us. What would happen if we could relate on the spirit level? What happens, I mean, what riches, what dynamic, what expanses would be available in relationship if we could relate on the spirit level? How beautiful or handsome would we all look? And I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about the beauty of your spirit. What would that look? Do you think that would endear any of us to each other? I mean, right now we see somebody do something really good. It's like, oh, that's a dear soul. God bless that dear soul. So our hearts are kind of endeared to one level. What happens if we saw the motives? I'm not talking about the negatives. Don't go down that way. You guys are not, you guys are not anchored into sin consciousness anymore, are you? No, we're being anchored in righteousness consciousness. And so what would happen if you could see the motives, the desires, this, the, the reaching that didn't quite get there, but the beauty of the reaching overpowered the fact that I didn't quite get there. And that beauty began to manifest, in, and you could see it, behold it, experience it in the spirit realm. 
the heavenly realm. Well, I happen to think that that's what God has waiting for you and I, that you and I could meet right here like this. We could even be sitting in the same room like this and have more reality of sitting in the uh, Mount Zion, have more reality of expression and experience and exchange in the spirit realm, in the heavenlies, than we have right now. I believe that's God's desire, and it's his design. And if I'm looking at my scripture right, it says that's what's happening, even though we probably, most of us are not experiencing that right now. Have you ever, has there ever been a verse in the Bible that you didn't know about until sometime later in your life, and all of a sudden you said, oh, yes, I love that verse, I'm going to walk in it, and then it became reality to you? You get the dynamic. There are, how many more things do you think are in God's heart that he's waiting for us to, for the proper, perfect timeliness? And he opens the door and says, come on in, the time's right. I believe this reality is going to rock our lives and blow our socks off. And by the way, I'm not a doomsday or gloom, doom and gloom guy, not at all. Because after all, Isaiah says, and of the increase of his government and his peace, there shall be no end. So if you're a doomsdayer, you might want to go back to the word and see what the word says. It says of the increase of his government and of his peace, there'll be no end. It's getting better. It's better today than it was yesterday. It's going to be better tomorrow. You see, we've been sold a bill of goods from the world and secular media and sadly, from garden variety of religion. And they actually use, sad to say, fear tactics to try to get us into heaven. And so, what happens, though, if some other plan, I mean pandemic, happens? Did I say that? I didn't say that, did I? Oh, Mark, I can't believe you said that. What happens if another thing happens, which is already trying to emerge, and they lock us down again or want to? Now, let's assume that you are not going to be a radical and you're going to assert your religious rights and whatever. Let's assume that you're going to try to be a good, good person. But now, now there are really no limits on your gathering because why? I'm already in heaven and Marisha is too, and Chuck is too. Hey, Chuck, what do you say tomorrow night we get together at 7 over at your house? Hawaii, yeah, that's better yet. Better yet. And if we haven't, if we're not into translation yet, meaning relocating, well, we are relocated in heaven. We are read about, reading about that. Hey, Next, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, let's set our faith, focus our attentions, engage with Holy Spirit, and we're going to meet around the throne. Take counsel with the counsel of God. And the angels, oh, yeah, the innumerable angels are really happy. We're going to in, enjoy fellowship together, and we're going to begin to learn how to relate on a realm that has never been practice very much it was practiced by the way if you're not sure if this is okay in exodus 24 moses and 72 or 73 guys i forget went up on the mountain had a meal with god and they ate on the sapphire stones that were as clear as glass and god exodus 24 exodus 24 and it might be 24 verse 24 maybe i'm not sure anyway and God, who had actually told them not to come up, the, up on the mountain. That's an interesting concept right there. You guys all stay down here. God says, Moses is going to come up. And these guys said, no way. We're going too. And so they went on up. And it says after that occasion where they had a meal. And God was not mad at them. I mean, whew, this touches my heart. It's the beauty of... Of the human soul, the human spirit says, I want to be with you, God. And even if you crash the gates a little bit, even if you bend the rules a little bit, he says, oh, wow, you do want me. 
Wow, what do you think that does to his heart? We're not doing it out of manipulation. We're not doing it for self-gain, self-glory, or anything like that. We're just doing it because I just want to be where you are. Wow, Whew. that's good stuff right there. I think I'm just getting a little pleasure of heaven on me, you know. But Father says, I like that. I'll bend the rules, and I won't be mad at you. <laughs> it's interesting because... Well, you can read that account and go deeper on it if you want. The church of the firstborn and all those names are written in heaven. Paul said, after he'd been to the third heaven and uh, he'd seen some things and whatever, and uh, somewhere in there, in another passage, he says, uh, I've determined not to know anyone according to the flesh. I wonder if he's functioning at this level. He says, you know what? I'm not going to look at what you look like on the outside, your words, your deportment, your actions. I'm not going to look at that anymore. I'm looking at your spirit, man. I begin, I've determined to only know you according to that. I think somehow he had probably, to, in my thinking, he had learned to relocate to the heavenlies, church of the firstborn and all those whose names are written in heaven. He says, I'm going to train my eyes, my abilities, my perspective to see in the heavenly realm. Guys and gals, I believe with all my heart in this new emerging age, which we haven't even really unpacked that, but it's a really big deal for me, that in this new emerging age, there will be some radically new paradigms. And this is just one of many. You and I will convene, but not like we've done in the past. Now, I'm not saying we won't do this. I'm not saying that at all. Because there's, it's always fun to hang out and eat cookies, you know, whatever. That's a lot of fun. But what would happen if a whole new dimension of capacity was opened up to us to meet in the heavenlies? And that, my friend, is, I think, one of about, four or five passages that gives it really powerful footing or foundation for it. And since my name is written in heaven, then I and all believers, those that are alive, you and I, and those that are passed on are here together right now. They're here with us today because you're already in this Mount Zion. And we've kind of had this negative mystique stigma thing against anybody who has been in the past. And if you haven't been here until today, until now, Jesus said, I am God of the living. I am not God of the dead. And in that same context, he mentions, I'm God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. And that was only 1,500 years earlier. They had been gone, dead, rotted in the ground. And if anybody was dead, they were dead. But Jesus didn't call him dead. He said he's God of the living. If you're in Christ, uh, if uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his ever, uh, my brain won't work. Get, for God so loved the world, he's the only begotten son that who shall ever. <laughs> Man, I can quote the hard ones. I can't quote the easy one. The, the last phrase, what's the last phrase? That's what I'm getting at. What, 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 what? Say it again. Say it one more time. <laughs> you are so good. If you're in Christ, do you die? Okay. Well, our last session today will deal with death even in the mortal body that I think God's going to reverse that. But if you are, if you're alive in Christ, meaning you are in Christ, then when you die, you don't die according to Jesus because he says, I'm God of the living. So what that says to me is when we're thinking about integrating with uh, the names that are written in heaven, which includes both the living and those who have passed on or transitioned, the issue of necromancy is not uh, appropriate or not applicable here if you're, if you're in Christ, if they're in Christ. Now, if they're not in Christ, I wouldn't feel free to do that. So, anyway, this is my, that's one man's opinion, all right? What did I say? You're 
all powerful to have your own opinion. If you disagree with me, fine. I don't mind at all. Don't say it publicly, probably. Just come to me privately and we'll talk, okay? And we've come to God, the judge of all. Oh, and by the way, let me back up just a little bit. The issue of having fellowship with uh, a saint somewhere else. Uh, take a look at Hebrews 11, verse 40. I had it marked here. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, 40. It says, um, back up to 39, 39. And 11, of course, is the Hall of Faith, and it mentions all the guys, you know, that did, and gals that did wonderful things. It says, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. It says, For God, having provided something better for us, that they would not be made perfect apart from us. Huh. So that means you and I are walking in better things than all of our predecessors. And that, listen to this, and this is what I think this verse helps us with. You go home and study it. You're noble Bereans, so you do the study, and I'm going to throw out a teaser. I think this verse offers to us that it is in their best interest and our best interest to learn how to cooperate together. Because why? They didn't get the good things we did, and they couldn't be perfected apart from us, they want to be perfected, and the way they get perfected is with us. And so their desire is to cooperate and partner with us, and I think our desire should be the same, reciprocated. We learn how to reciprocate together. So I just throw that out as a little teaser, and you guys are noble Brians, so go for it. Let me just take uh, one phrase out of 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 5, let's see, yeah, 5, very good, and uh, I'm going to just talk about um, the capacity of when we live in heaven, this is a kind of an interesting concept that gets opened up here, when we live in heaven there are no time, distance, limitations, barriers, that sort of thing, because heaven is spirit, it's not limited to flesh and blood and laws of physics, okay, so Verse, chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. And this is having to do with the guy who they were going to legislate some church discipline against because he'd been living in sin with his father's wife. And so uh, it was a bad deal going down. And so Paul is prescribing how they're going to administer this. He says, well, right now I'm absent from you, but I'm present in the spirit. But I've already judged this man, and as though I were present, concerning him who has done this deed. Okay, now, here are three qualifiers, and this is very interesting to me. Speaking of meeting together in the Spirit, so Paul is practicing this right now. Listen how it unfolds. unfolds. He says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and some versions say, when you are gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's qualification number one before they are administer this church discipline. He said, along with my spirit. Some versions say, when you sense my spirit is among you. Okay, and then third qualifier is, and with the power of the Lord Jesus. Some versions say, when you feel the power of the Lord Jesus, or when you know the power of Jesus is among you. So I maintain that there are three qualifiers here. Paul's going to do business. He wants them to do business, and he's going to participate with them, not from afar, but he's going to trans-relocate in the spirit. This time, he evidently, he does not do it physically. But he says he wants them to not move on anything in this discipline until they know that his spirit is among them. That means that sometimes he wasn't and sometimes he was. And so evidently they were practiced in this. They were familiar when Paul was with them or when he wasn't. You see, guys, I think we got a little growing up to do, don't, don't we? We do. I'm telling you, there's some realities sitting out there that are in our Bibles that are just waiting for us to mine out the gold, find the positions of Rhema, Revelation, that empowers into the reality. Okay? 
Moving on down in our Hebrews 12 passage, I'm sure this opens up lots of questions in a lot of your minds, but you're going to be the Bereans. Go after it. Uh, number five, we've come to God, the judge of all. Awesome, my father. And when I think of judge, do you think negative or positive? Okay. All right. We got a couple say positive. Most people, because of our sinfulness consciousness, we think of negative. He's going to judge me. How many of you, when you see a cop, does your foot automatically come off the accelerator? Oh, what does that say? Do you drive with a guilty conscience? <laughs> oh, Mark, Mark, you're meddling. You're meddling, Mark. <laughs> But how about, how about this verse in Daniel 7? Daniel 7, it says, And the horn made war with the saints, and it prevailed for a time, until the Ancient of Days came and made a judgment, I wonder what kind of judgment, in favor of the saints. Now, do you like judgment? Come on. Come on. You see, it just depends on our orientation. The fact that we have this sinfulness consciousness that makes us fearful of a judgment just tells how many tentacles of the old is still residual in us. We just got, we got a, a journey to go on. But it's, it's happening. We're getting there. And the first step is to being aware of it. Oh, I need to deal with this. Yeah. So, number six, the spirits of just men made perfect. And I kind of jumped ahead. I cited the Hebrews 1140 passage. Holy Spirit, and so I might ask the Holy Spirit, what's the appropriate interaction for my maturity level? See, for some of us, it's probably not quite time yet. We need to go through maybe the angel step first. I don't know. It's just my perspective. You may be way ahead of me, but... Uh, most of us are probably going to have to get good at angelic because they're in heavenly. It's okay, I can deal with this. And then, oh my, that's the next verse in Hebrews 12, isn't it? You know, it's like, okay, Lord, can we start that one, you know? So anyway, just you know, our maturity level is going to probably determine much of how we integrate and experience these things. Number seven, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And we say something like, wow, Jesus, it's all about you. Man, am I so glad I'm here with you. This is awesome. I'm learning to live with you in this Mount Zion. There's no more distance, no more delay, no more living afar off. And Jesus, you made it so doggone simple. Who would have believed? Who could have thunk it? That it would be so easy just to walk through the door in John 10, 9. Number eight. We've come to the sprinkled blood. The spring speaks better than the word, uh, better word than the blood of Abel. I love the power of your blood, Jesus, over my life. I do. It's cleansing, protecting, and power. And then the last verse of that chapter, and to God who's a consuming fire. Now, this is kind of goes akin to the judgment thing. Consuming fire, does that sound good or bad to you? <laughs> I know. I know. It's kind of a, but yeah, if, if we see it as God consuming all those things that are enemies to our soul or enemies to our true identity, then hello, bring it on, right? Now that might require some refiner's fire in the process of renewing my mind. We also call it regeneration, biblical word, regeneration by the water of the word. His word washes me and it begins to regenerate. You see, your spirit man got made complete, pure, holy, righteous, seated, whatever all. Think of all the best adjectives you think. Seated. That, was, that happened at salvation, but your soul still is in the process. That's why the Bible says, uh, be ye transfigured by getting a new mind. So that's the process that's still going on. The regeneration part, regenerating my mind, renewing it. Okay, you get the point. Okay, good deal. You doing okay with that? How about some questions 
or comments before we move to the next stage. Yeah. Yeah. I, when you said that, I was just mindful of Mike Bickle when he said all the things that hinder love, like the fire and the, and the baptism, the different baptisms, water, water, <laughs> spirit, fire, and it's all the things that hinder love. Not a bad thing. We have to train our minds. You see, we've let the world and failure and disappointment and abuse and whatever train our minds in a negative perspective. We do. We have to take every thought captive. Yeah. Good job. David. Oh, good job. Super. Um, did I say the trying of our faith works? I uh, yeah, quoted that. Uh, how about this one? Uh, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us. Wait a minute. Uh, pruning, uh, discipline, Hebrews 12, discipline of God. Every son whom the father loves, he disciplines, right? In fact, the word is scourges, which is just... In fact, it goes on to say, it describes the scourge. It says, every discipline seems more, uh, gosh, I got to quote that because I'm going to mess it up if I don't quote it. Uh, oh, well, no chastening, no dis discipline seems joyful for the moment, but grievous. But afterwards produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now, you see as we mature. At babies, how long is a baby's attention span? Okay. And how long as we grow up, as we mature, our attention span hopefully grows longer. <laughs> and so if you and I can have a bigger perspective, bigger picture perspective, then when we get in hardships or chastening or disciplining, and we realize it's the Lord. It's what he's doing. He's paring away. He's pruning. So it says every father, every son whom the father loves. So if this happens and we've got big picture perspective, we can have an attention span that says, okay, Lord, I say, I say uncle. I surrender. Because why? It's going to yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Somebody else? Tonight. Uh, or I should say at four-ish, about four o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, we have some notes in your folder there. We'll refer to those and talk through it. And we're going to have an ugly, 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 nasty breakup with death. 